my name is Pastor Naomi Cease Carriker, and I'm the senior pastor at the Lutheran Church of the Nativity in Arden, North Carolina. Here we are again, worshiping physically apart, but spiritually together in our homes with the people and animals we are quarantined with. I am starting to feel very weary and tired of bringing you worship in this particular way. But we know the virus is not done especially here in Buncombe County where cases of where diagnosed cases are increasing. And so we stay home. We stay apart. We keep our distance. We wear our masks when we go out in order to keep each other safe and in order to keep our neighbors safe and in order to keep strangers that we don't know safe. But God is with us and God's spirit is moving in this time of pre-recorded worship in your lives now and every day to come. So my friends, since this is a pre-recorded worship, you are welcome to watch it anytime. And if you're watching it through Facebook, please like this worship and share it on your pages so that other people can participate as well. Let us continue on this third Sunday after Pentecost with our brief order for confession and forgiveness. As we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in our lives through worship, let us call to mind and confess our sins. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As siblings in God's family, we come together to ask God for forgiveness. God eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor, against our friends and against strangers, in what we have thought, in what we have said, and in what we have done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Friends, God will enrich you with grace and nourish you with blessing. God will defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. God accepts your prayers and absolves you from your offenses. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve others as you served, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 20. O Lord, you who have enticed me, and I was enticed. You were too powerful for me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention the Lord or speak any more in the name of the Lord, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around, denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps Jeremiah can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their internal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For the Lord has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from Romans chapter 6. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of the master's household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing is secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. 
So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus also said, Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a son against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and in-laws against one another, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Fear. Is there any more persuasive or powerful motivating force in the human experience? Fear. From the moment we're born, we learn to fear the world around us, certainly to fear the stranger, sometimes to fear even those who are closest to us. Fear. Political leaders have long recognized the power of fear, which was certainly true in Jesus' time as it is now, in ensuring our conformity to the structures of this world, even when doing so does not serve our best interests. Jesus recognizes that fear will also cause a failure of discipleship. Jesus' disciples courageously leave the security of their homes and families to follow him as they proclaim God's reign, but they too will know and will ultimately bow before the power of fear. Faithful proclamation and the practice of the gospel inevitably puts disciples on a collision course with the powers of this world. So in our gospel this morning, Jesus prepares his disciples for their mission. He also starkly is realistic about the threats they will face. At the same time, he builds the case for why they should not let this fear master them or hinder their witness. On the one hand, the disciples are granted remarkable powers to heal exercise demons, cleanse lepers, even raise the dead. But Jesus also denies them money, extra clothes, a staff for protection. They are to undertake their mission in complete vulnerability and dependence on God, even knowing that as they go as sheep into the midst of wolves, they face arrests and beatings, opposition even from family members, hatred and persecution. So why does Jesus highlight the horrors that await the disciples? As Jesus continues to describe the worst case scenarios wound together with statements of reassurance and repeated calls to resist fear, he names aloud the suffering to be endured and its causes which is the first step in freeing them from the tenacious grip of fear, naming it. The important element of reassurance lies in the integral relationship that is affirmed between the disciples and Jesus, and through Jesus, God. So what are we to make of this week's lectionary as a whole, which explodes off the page with dire provocative language that sounds incredibly fear-inducing and anything but peaceful? In our reading from Jeremiah, we hear the phrase, the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. 
As Jeremiah uses this to describe the presence of God in his life, I'll admit, I don't like to preach or even think about the God whom we should fear. The God I know is a God of love and forgiveness and reconciliation and grace. But I wonder, are we, the 21st century church, willing to fear God in ways that are actually right and necessary? Do we recognize that when it comes to evil, injustice, and oppression, God is in fact a dread warrior against those things? Are we willing, for example, to allow God to shatter the monolith that is white privilege and white supremacy in America? Are we prepared to allow God to show us the ways in which we are racist or sexist or hold bias, even if we are unaware of those truths about ourselves? Are we open to God warring against our thoughtless consumerism, our casual lusts, our quiet hatred, our unexamined idolatries? Are we open to God breaking our hearts with compassion so that we can welcome into our midst the stranger, the refugee, the immigrant, the exile? Make no mistake, God's peace does not come at the expense of holiness righteousness, mercy, and justice. However, some things must break, must shatter, must die before the word of God can take root and grow. Whether it's confronting sin in my personal life or a corporate failure in my communal or national life, the question that matters is this, do I trust God? Do we trust God? to be a dread warrior doing battle against the evil within and around us? Do I really want God's word to engage my life in the places where I am the most stubborn, the most naive, the most afraid of change? Am I willing to have the dread warrior of God push me into attacking injustice at its very core, at my very core? Or do I just want a soft substitute? And then in our gospel, we have hard words again when Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. It's important to remember that Jesus is, it's not his desire or purpose to set fathers against sons or mothers against daughters. It is certainly not his will that we stir up conflict for conflict's sake or use his words to justify violence or war. But his words are a necessary reminder that the peace Jesus offers, it's not the fake peace of denial dishonesty, or harmful accommodation. His is a holistic, truth-telling peace, the kind of deep, life-changing peace that doesn't hesitate to break in order to mend, to cut in order to heal. Jesus will name the realities we don't want named. He will upset the hierarchies we'd rather keep intact. He will expose the lies we tell ourselves out of cowardice or out of laziness or out of obstinance. And Jesus will disrupt all dynamics in our relationships with ourselves and with each other that keep us from wholeness and holiness. And this is not because Jesus wants us to suffer. Suffer. It's because he knows that real peace is worth fighting for. Consider the fact that in his earthly ministry, no one met Jesus without feeling compelled to change. 
He constantly brought people to the point of crisis, tension, movement, transformation. He constantly led people to decisions their families and communities didn't understand. And so I have to ask myself, when was the last time my faith divided me? When was the last time my faith encouraged holy division, holy change in my or someone else's heart? In other words, what am I most invested in? My comfort or the real peace that Jesus brings? Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew knows that human nature is accustomed to remain comfortable in our denial so as to avoid exposure, and that we are also quite adept at dodging disclosure, making up excuses, sidestepping the truth. And because of that, Jesus says, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing is secret that will not become known. So what should we be most afraid of? Not insult, not change, not persecution, not death. What we should fear, these passages of scripture tell us, is a life half-lived, a life of blandness and niceness, a life disengaged of devotion, a life of piety without working to bring the true peace that Jesus offers the world. Scripture offers us so many wonderful and beautiful names for Jesus. The Son of God, the Son of Man, Emmanuel, Logos, Lord, Christ. Dare we add another? Jesus, the disturber of the peace. What would it be like to allow Jesus to disturb us, unmake us, divide us? What would it be like to experience the peace that costs, the peace that breaks, to ultimately know the peace that saves? Jesus will indeed guide our feet into the way of peace. He will, but only if we let him. May we do so. Amen. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Let your song be sung from mountains high. Sing a new Yahweh's people dance for joy. Oh, come before the Lord and play for him on glad tambourine and let a trumpet sound. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Let your song my children from your sleep your Savior now has come He has turned your sorrow to joy and filled your soul with song Sing a new song unto the Lord Let your song be Glad my soul for I
Let us profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praying separately in our homes and together in the Spirit, let us pray for the church, the earth, the world, and all who are in need. O oh God, hold your church in your loving arms. Bless the work of evangelists and teachers as they translate their faith into other languages. Strengthen our pastors, deacons, and church councils for their ministry during these troubling times. Hear us and help us, O oh God. Your love is kind. O oh God, our ruler, inspire our president, our governors, and our legislators to work towards justice for all. Lead us to ways of life that are free from racial and ethnic prejudice, strengthen the world's democracies, and sustain those who are working to secure free and safe elections. Give a home to refugees and the homeless. Hear us and help us, O oh God. Your love is kind. O oh God, our physician, bring healing to all who are sick and suffering. Preserve the world from more waves of the coronavirus and guide researchers who are seeking a vaccine. Protect those whose jobs expose them to contagion. Support our healthcare workers. Hear us and help us, O oh God, your love is kind. O oh God, our peacemaker, inhabit each household in the land with your powerful peace. Train us to live together in harmony, especially when quarantined together. Nourish marriages and sustain extended families. Protect children from harm of every kind. Hear us and help us, O oh God, your love is kind. O oh God, our source of life, bless all fathers and father figures as they face both long-standing and emerging family needs. Comfort those who long to be fathers and those for whom this day is difficult. Hear us and help us, O oh God, your love is kind. O oh God, our beginning and our end, we bless you for all our forebears in family and faith who have lived and died in you. Remind us of their sacrifices, and at the end, bring us with them in your household of joy. Hear us and help us, O oh God, your love is kind. O oh God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illuminate our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, Awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. This Father's Day, give thanks for loving, wonderful fathers who have given their children so many invaluable gifts. Give thanks for new fathers, welcoming new life into the world. Give thanks for those who choose their children, for adoptive and foster parents who model the adoptive love of God. Give thanks for uncles and godfathers and neighbors who share paternal love with so many children and for far too often overlooked stepfathers. Give thanks for those who choose to remain without biological children, sharing love with the world in many ways. Pray for the many fathers who have had to bear the unimaginable burden of burying a child, and those who have borne the silent grief of stillbirth or miscarriage. Pray for those who struggle with infertility, those who desire for a child is met with frustration. Pray for the fathers of children with special needs and chronic illness who know anxiety and exhaustion better than most. Pray for those who were given abuse and heartbreak by the ones called to love them. Pray for fathers who have made the difficult and loving decision 
to entrust a child to adoptive parents. Pray for those fathers who have died, who on this day celebrate and grieve their father in his absence. Amen. Our Father, art the heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make us this day our daily bread, give us our trespasses, and those trespasses against us. Please not into the temptation, and not the evil, thine the kingdom, and power, and glory, for never and ever. Amen. Jesus tells us, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. O God, you pour out your spirit on all. You empower us to know your truth and fearlessly proclaim your gospel among nations. Your love fires our hearts, and in your spirit we hunger and thirst for justice in the world. The God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send forth your spirit, O God, and renew the face of the earth. And the God of grace, bless us now and forever. Amen. Thank you.